Our first speaker today is Brian Shelter, Head of Special Collections here at the Wright Library. Brian is going to provide an overview of the collection, the Jensen Collection, to give you all an idea of what is to be found here. Brian will be followed by Adam Idol, a Roman Catholic ethicist currently teaching at Yale University. This will be followed by some reflections given by Solve, Solve Gold, Robert Jensen's granddaughter. Solve will then read some reflections from Jensen's good friend, Robert George, who is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. We will then hear reflections from the Reverend Dr. Matthew Burdett. Matthew is an Episcopal priest. He is has served a curacy in Dallas, did his doctorate on uh, Robert Jensen's eschatology, and is currently working uh, in Iowa in publishing, I think he told me. He is also uh, associate director of the Center for Catholic and Evangelical Theology founded by Jens and his good friend, Carl Broughton. This will be followed by reflections from the Reverend Dr. Kara Slade, Kara is a priest and theologian in residence at Trinity Episcopal Church here in Princeton. Her remarks will be read by Jens' daughter, Kari Gold. The event will conclude with some remarks of my own. It will be followed by a wine and cheese reception for those attending in person, which will be held downstairs in the Torrance Atrium. Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here today to help celebrate the life and legacy of Robert Jensen. Um, as Bruce mentioned, I am the head of special collections and archives here at Princeton Theological Seminary. And in many ways, my job is all about life and legacy. Uh, as a person in charge of the historical records of this institution, as well as the archival material, rare books, and artifacts that make up the historical record, it is my job to ensure the longevity and safekeeping of these items. And I'm honored to be in a position to help provide a safe and secure home for important works such as the Jensen Collection. The Special Collections and Archives Department here at PTS contains over 100,000 rare books and manuscripts dating from the 15th century in print and the third century in manuscript form. In addition, we have a large collection of artifacts and archaeological materials, uh, some of which that go back more than 4,000 years. This world-class collection of materials used by PTS students, faculty, and staff, but also by visiting scholars and researchers from around the globe. In addition, the seminary houses more than 400 archival collections that comprise really uh, nearly 6,000 linear feet of material, which is more than a mile of paper, if you can imagine that. Um, these archival collections uh, are really the heartbeat of the archives and where I work. Uh, they contain unique and irreplaceable items that can only be found here at PTS and are among our most treasured and heavily used uh, parts of the collection. They tell stories of organizations, institutions, and most significantly, people. The archival record from presidents to pastors, from students to staff members, from theologians to theorists, and even missionaries and some malcontents can all be found in the stacks of our special collections holdings. And it is the personal people-focused collections that are often the most interesting, working with material that has been collected, shaped, and curated by some of the most significant scholars and thinkers in theological study uh, is truly a pleasure for me to be a part of. And being able to connect those resources with researchers and academics is a wonderful part of my job. The Robert W. Jensen papers are no exception to this rule. Jensen's small but mighty collection provides a personal and intimate insight into the working mind of an outstanding theologian who made nearly incalculable contributions to the world of theology. As with each archival set within our holdings, the Jensen collection was brought into my department after it was kindly donated by the Jensen family. And once on site, my staff and I worked to create a thorough inventory of the materials to rehouse items into long lasting and archivally sound folders and boxes, even including the removal of some rusty staples. So don't let anyone tell you that library work is not dangerous. Uh, and finally, and what we're celebrating today is the creation of a formal finding aid to represent the organization of the material and its accessibility to researchers. Uh, I would like to mention and, and commend and thank two PTS students, uh, Ben Van Heitzma and Stephen Kang, who worked together with me to complete the first major inventory of the collection, and they did a lot of that work of rehousing, uh, which is really essential to the long-term, uh, the longevity of the collection. 
without Ben and, and Stephen's careful and thorough work, uh, we would not have been able to clearly uh, see the structure of the collection and put together a finding aid uh, as quickly and efficiently as we did. So a uh, big thanks to them for their help. And with their help and through uh, the efforts of my staff, we are able to now fully uh, make all of this collection accessible to any researchers who want to come and review the material here in person uh, at PTS. Um, it's really a wonderful opportunity to see a progression from start to finish within a short amount of time to make this material available to as many researchers as we can. Um, as I mentioned, the papers themselves provide a glimpse into the personal work uh, of Robert Jensen and his legacy. The collection is broken up into eight distinctive series, each por portraying a different aspect of Robert's working life. Um, from correspondence with colleagues and friends, to drafts and manuscripts of his published works, to the published versions themselves, texts and notes for sermons, research materials, and even audio recordings of his speeches, sermons, and talks. The collection provides numerous inroads to see how Robert worked and how his ideas went from concept to completion. Um, there's something really wonderful to, to see with someone's handwritten notations on their own work where they're sort of editing themselves in real time, uh, which you don't really get to see from a final product, only through these archival uh, studies. So I'm, I'm very fond of saying that uh, these archival um, collections really give you insight into the person's mind more than you would get from reading a published work or even hearing a sermon, uh, a lecture, or a talk. Um, I also like to talk about the archives as being filled with unwritten stories, dissertations yet to be researched, and gems yet to be uncovered. And the Jensen Papers will provide numerous opportunities for future students, scholars, and theologians to explore the works and efforts of a great thinker, author, and educator. Um, I have a copy here of the Finding Aid, which is also available online. I encourage you all to go and take a look at it and then come and visit us to uh, see it for yourself in person. Um, and I'm very glad to be a part of the process to help his collection find a permanent home here at Princeton Seminary and ensure its safety and security in the stacks of the library and provide future visitors with a glimpse into the wonderful life and fruitful legacy of Robert Jensen. Thank you very much. Adam Idle, are you here? Yes. Hello, good afternoon. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Um, thanks to the seminary. I am a graduate of this institution and it's, it's really lovely to be back, uh, not least for such a special occasion. I, I knew Gents to be a man who could say in five words what the rest of us could say in 10 or 12. And so I, I won't speak in his honor without uh, clinging to the same rule of brevity. But I do want to say a couple of things today. I want to, I want to say something about what I think I saw in Robert Jensen and what I hope that others will see in the work that um, has been given to the library uh, for the study of theology. I want to do that by telling a quick story or a couple of stories, a story within a story, maybe another besides. I discovered the systematic theology, Robert Jensen's systematic theology, when I was in my first year here at Princeton Seminary, and I was one of those college students who spent more time um, racing bikes and drinking beer than studying, and I had a long road ahead of me. Uh, and I found myself a bit turned around, a bit um, a bit confused by the uh, the theology that I was encountering and the mode in which it was done. Uh, Princeton Seminary and no divinity school or seminary um, in my my experience has ever been, I think, what like what I thought it would be in, when I naively applied uh, for for um, uh, an MDiv. At some point, uh, someone put me on to the systematic theology, and I remember I was well. I, it's, I can't really say I was sitting in this room over here because it's it's been demolished. Um, but if, but something 
the predecessor to a room over here, and I remember opening it for the first time, and I remember being astonished. I was astonished. I, I, I mean, I really mean that I was, I was, this has happened a couple of times in my life, but I remember thinking, who, who is this man? Who is this? Um, I was trying to think back to what it was that so astonished me, and I'll, I'll try to return to that, but I, I can't say honestly that I, I can represent to you today what that was, but what I do remember is that sometime, maybe it was later that day, maybe it was, uh, maybe it was later that week, that month, but I was talking at a table with Bruce McCormick and a group of PhD students, and I, I was kind of one of those little yappy master students bouncing around, just kind of hoping for some scraps. And, <laughs> and, but they let me sit there. And someone said, well, you know, Robert Jensen just lives right down the street. And I said, excuse me, where? <laughs> they said, no, 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 literally just right there. You, you know, it's a stone's throw away, you could walk. And at that moment, um, whatever everyone was talking about sort of just kind of faded away and I, I, I turned inward and I began plotting. <laughs> and what follows um, uh, is one of my proudest moments um, and in, but also um, yeah, it's hard to tell this without a twinge of embarrassment but I decided that I would go to another room over here, this way, also now demolished. And would, I would print off my papers that I'd written so far. One on Anselm, one on St. Paul, one on Bart, one on Origen. And that I would go and give them to Robert Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> and I would write him a note of introduction, telling him a little bit about myself. And I can't remember what I wrote, but I, I think the emotional content of it was essentially this. Hi, my name's Adam. I really, 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 really like your book. Here's some of my thoughts so far. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and as I was walking down Mercer Street, I, uh, about the time I realized that I had no plan, was I going to put this in the mailbox? Um, was I going to turn around? Was I going to hand it to him? What if he was there? What does he look like? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And about that time, I think I was about to turn around, I ran into Blanche on the sidewalk. And I knew who she was because I'd seen um, uh, gents and Blanche at a couple of conferences. You know, I, I mean, I wasn't stalking them, but I, I knew who they were. And before I could put the words back in my mouth, I just said, excuse me, are you Blanche Jensen? Yes, of course you are. I'm Adam Idle, and here's some things I've written, and they're not very good. Most of them are very short, but I was wondering if I could talk to your husband about them. He's, I think, my favorite theologian. And um, little did I know that, uh, that Blanche was there on Mercer. She had been collecting Jensen's materials that were left over because he had he had retired the day before or something along those lines from the CTI as, as the president. And um, she very politely took the folder, went home, and then the next morning, I got an email. That's the point of the story. It's not, the point of the story isn't my, my audacity, um, my, my complete lack of self-awareness. <laughs> um, <laughs> The presumption. It was the fact that the question I'd asked him was answered with a yes. He, he answered me. He said, dear Adam Idol, you should come to my house at 2 p.m. on Friday. <laughs> Robert Jensen. <laughs> and what followed, um, what followed was, um, something that I am beyond grateful for. And I know now, um, as, a, as a professor, 
how difficult it is to, um, to open up a life and to um, share it with another person. And I know how difficult it is to take seriously um, the questions of someone who's just starting out. I remember that first time that I went to go meet with gents and I was peppering them with questions. And part of this, I think, was just that uh, there was a time of adjustment required this kind of Scandinavian, Minnesotan silence. I felt the urge. I had to fill it. So I was asking, well, do you think that the, the Jonathan Edwards' notion of habitus is the same as Thomas Aquinas's? And what, what is the Chalcedonian formula? And do you think Bruce McCormick is, is right about all this, about the Trinity? And, and whatever on earth will we, and, and on, and, 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 and. And at one point, he just looked at me. And he said, I thought you came to hear me talk. <laughs> well, another conversation several years down the road. I, the, other, the second audacious proposal I ever remember making uh, to Jensen was that we should read his, his systematic theology together and, and talk about it on a weekly basis. And take as long to do this as, as it took. And again, he said yes. And this led to a number of other uh, uh, engagements. We, we read books together for 11 years. <laughs> I was in graduate school for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> One conversation I remember, somehow I had talked him into reading Plato with me and some friends, and we had stumbled upon Plato's Gorgias. And I remember as plain as day, gents saying, look, there's something here to remember. You know, Gorgias was a slick talker. He was a wheeler and dealer. He came to town and he would say, there is no truth. If there were, we couldn't know it. If we could know it, we couldn't talk about it. And he would say all this with such conviction and with such verve and at such length that you would forget what he was saying. And you would be dazzled by the, just the event of it. He wasn't the first professional theologian but there are people like Gorgias still around, you know. I know. This led me to wonder, as I was thinking in the past couple of days, what it was that I did see in gents, what, what, what it was that I was so astonished by. Here are a couple of thoughts. I don't know if this is what first struck me. I suspect it was not but it's what struck me as I began reading through the systematic theology again. First, I could see that the man behind this work was drunk with God. You know, he wasn't like one of those uh, people stumble, stumbling around at Pentecost as though he were drunk at the ninth hour, but he was en enchanted. He couldn't get enough of God. And I could see that. The second was, as I, and I've already mentioned this, his brevity, but I began to see his brevity in the, in the past days as something different than a mere matter of style or inclination. I began to see his brevity as a theological commitment, something deeply rooted in that God drunkenness. <clears throat> Jens said little, or as little as he thought he needed to, about the subject of theology, God. In light of what he believed human beings were, 
as images of God. Made for communion with God, for conversation, for exchange, for genuine friendship. And from these commitments came a resolute refusal to participate in the sophistic manipulations of professional theologians. You know, he just wasn't much for bluster. In the beginning of the systematic theology, I, I found a passage that I had underlined several times in different kinds of ink, which tells me that I've, it's a passage I've returned to again and again, and I'll read it for you now. Jens asked, what is the fate of a culture that has long heard the gospel and then determined its theology and institutions and hopes thereby, but has then ceased to believe? Nietzsche's prophecy seemed veridical. Nihilism must be the fate of a once but no longer culturally Christian West. Jens then goes on to say, and I'm still quoting, the proclaimed nihilism of our academic elites has turned Nietzsche's prophecy into a curriculum and rules of correct behavior. End quote. I think Robert Jensen would be the last person to want to be accused of being a prophet. But I, he was saying something true, I think, about our current moment. And that brings me back to what I hope people will find in Jens's work. What I hope that someone like me um, will discover um, stumbling into the archives up here where his works are now housed. I hope they find someone who as, an, as God drunk as Jensen was, who can lead them to the God about whom he could not and would not say very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Solveig Gold. I know there is much that is unique about my grandfather's theology, but I couldn't until recently have begun to tell you what. You see, everything I knew about Christianity, I knew from Poppy. From my perspective, what he said about God wasn't Robert Jensen's theology, it was simply theology. On the one hand, Poppy shaped my understanding of God with his words, many of them contained in our book, Conversations with Poppy About God. But he also shaped my understanding of God through our relationship, the relationship between grandfather and granddaughter. Because as he explained to me in Conversations with Poppy, God is a relationship. Here is an excerpt. Poppy. Jesus is the Son, and there is God the Father, and there is God only in the relationship between them. Can you think that? See, there is you, and there is me, and we have a relationship between us. Solve. Right, but see, with Jesus and God, they have an equal relationship. Poppy. That's right. And that relationship is what we call God, with just the word itself. Relationship? Yep. God is a relationship between Jesus and his father. If God is the relationship between Jesus and his father, then we can come to understand God through our own familial relationships, relationships that are imperfect images of that divine relationship. So at the risk of blasphemy, what did I learn about God through my relationship with Poppy? Well, I admit that it was always tempting to think of God the Father as Poppy's image, an old man with a long white beard. But Poppy was quick to disabuse me of this, and although with his beard, belly, sweet tooth, and comfy lap, Poppy did bear an uncanny resemblance to Santa Claus, readers of Conversations with Poppy will know that he was also quick to disabuse me of the idea that Santa Claus was, as I stubbornly insisted, very much like God. He was quick to disabuse me of my stupider ideas, but he wasn't inflexible. Eventually, for instance, I got Poppy to concede that Santa Claus was 
a little bit like God. <laughs> I also persuaded him that when we cross ourselves, the Holy Spirit goes fittingly between the Father and the Son. And then there was our knockdown, drag out fight in fourth grade around the dinner table. I was explaining what I'd learned in science class that week, and Poppy refused to believe that inclined planes counted as simple machines. For hours, we argued about this. Until the next morning, Poppy appeared with his tail between his legs to tell me sheepishly that, yes, I was right. Inclined planes are simple machines. <laughs> What does Poppy's begrudging flexibility have to do with my understanding of God? Poppy was famous for belting out hymns in church, but there was one hymn he refused to sing, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. God is not invisible, Poppy insisted. God is revealed to us through Jesus. And Poppy took special issue with the third verse. I'll sing it for you now because despite Poppy's protestations, it's a damn good tune. To all life thou givest, to both great and small. In all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. The Christian God, Poppy would explain, is not the Aristotelian unmoved mover. God the Father is flexible and can be moved by human prayer. Because of his son, Jesus, who invited us into the divine relationship when he taught us to pray, our Father. Moreover, and this was my favorite lesson from Poppy, God can be moved to laughter. Poppy was certain that God has a sense of humor. As he said in conversations with Poppy, if God didn't have an immense sense of humor, he wouldn't put up with us at all. And I think he also teases us, that is, provokes us from time to time. I responded, if we trip over a rug, he just sort of, Poppy finished my sentence, laughs. Poppy and I loved to laugh with and at each other. Before he was Poppy, he was Gents. But before he was Gents, he was Billy Bob, a mischievous child who refused to sit properly in his high chair. Billy Bob's silly streak never disappeared. Whether he was performing a magic trick, wearing a lobster hat to dinner, or falling in a puddle, or puddle we used to sing about Poppy in the puddle Poppy never took himself or his loved ones too seriously. We sang about puddles, we sang about God, and on Christmas Eve each year, we sang our robust family rendition of Good King Wenceslas, with Poppy bellowing out the part of the monarch. It was music, Bach especially, that kept Poppy from following his many friends across the Tiber. And it was music that kept our family united around the table, even when the discussion devolved into fights about inclined planes. Little surprise then that Poppy concluded volume one of the systematic theology with the arresting claim that God is a melody with three singers. That is, God is a great fugue. In my high school yearbook, Mimi and Poppy submitted an ad with Poppy's characteristic wit. To Miss Muffet, as they always called me, all things considered, a very satisfactory granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said in conversations with Poppy, Poppy was more than a satisfactory grandfather. He was a, quote, pretty perfect grandpa. Poppy hastened to point out that an absolutely perfect grandpa would have to be God. <laughs> Nevertheless, through my pretty perfect grandpa, I came to have a glimpse of what Poppy called the life of excitement in God, an excitement I observed at eight years old, not unlike the excitement of sitting in your grandpa's lap. Thank you. And now I have the honor of reading uh, Robbie George's tribute to my grandfather. I wish I could be there with you in person to join in paying tribute to my beloved friend, Robert Jensen. I'm grateful to Solvay, though, for reading aloud these brief reflections in what I will call, in, a shameless, in an act of shameless larceny, the four loves of Robert Jensen. 
When I met Jens, I was a young man just starting out in academic life. He was already an eminent figure in academia. He treated me like an equal, though, and did it in a way that I will describe. What usually brought us together were seminars hosted by Richard Newhouse under the auspices of First Things Magazine and the Institute on Religion and Public Life. Most of the participants were famous scholars at the top of their professions, like Jens himself. Gilbert Mylander, David Novak, Marianne Glendon, Avery Dulles, people like that. I was one of a small number of youngsters, the kids. The grown-ups would often argue fiercely among themselves. If one said something another disagreed with, which happened all the time, suddenly it was Ali versus Frazier in the Thrilla at Manila. When, however, I or one of the other kids said something that one of the grown-ups disagreed with, most of the grown-ups would take a firm, to be sure, but still somewhat softer approach. Not condescending, mind you, just, well, not too aggressive. Except Jens. He treated me and the other kids, but I have to say this, especially me, like one of the grown-ups. If he disagreed with one of us, or even if he just wanted to play devil's advocate, he didn't pull his punches, if I may stick with the boxing metaphor. And as I suggested, I seem to be on the receiving end of some of his sharpest blows. In the beginning, I wondered whether Professor Jensen had something against me in particular, or whether for some reason I rubbed him the wrong way. But it became clear in short order that the reverse was true. Jens treated me as he might treat, say, David Novak or Gil Mylander, because he was fond of me saw some potential there, and wanted me to be the best I could be. He was mentoring me, just like a tough old boxing manager with a heart of gold, mentoring a young pugilist he wanted to train to be a champion. All of this takes me to the first of Jens's four loves. Jens loved debate. He thrived on it. He was a man of ideas, and the play of ideas was a joy to him. Still, for all his ferocity in debate, he was not an ideologue or a dogmatist, nor was he an autocrat. He was not the sort who flew into a rage over being disagreed with. He genuinely wanted to argue with people, not dictate to them. He just loved debate. But then there is Jens's second and higher love. Jens loved truth. Debate was fun. He enjoyed the heck out of it. But there was a telos, a purpose to it, namely to get at the truth of things. Debate for its own sake, or to show off his debater's prowess, or to win a victory or impress an audience, had no appeal to him. Even when he would assume the role of the devil's advocate, it was always with a view to getting to the truth of the matter under discussion. The kind of debate he loved was truth-oriented debate. Then here is Jens's third love. Jens loved Blanche. My heavens, did Jens love that dear woman. It was not in a showy way with lots of public displays of affection. He was not uxorious in the pejorative sense of that word. But Blanche was always there or nearby. He always treated her with respect and indeed esteem. In a word, he honored her. He drew, he drew strength from her. She was his rock. And never was he ashamed of that or reluctant for others to know it. Blanche meant the world to gents, and it showed in every aspect of his life, including his life as a scholar. And then there is Jens's fourth love, the one that suffused all his other loves, deepening and ennobling them in every dimension. Jens loved Jesus. Not all theologians do, you know. Not all pastors do, not all Christians do, but Jens did. He may have been a rather high church Lutheran with fancy academic credentials and the author of complex and subtle works of theological scholarship which explored the question of homoousios or homoousios, but his relationship with the Lord was as intense and personal, indeed as intimate, as that of any fundamentalist preacher. Had such a preacher accosted him on the street as he was walking by and urgently demanded, brother, 
Do you have a personal relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Gents could and would have said, yes, preacher, I do. And indeed, he did. Our next speaker is Matthew Burdett. I uh, met Jens when I was a graduate student. I was worshiping at uh, Trinity Episcopal Church here next door in Princeton, uh, and, and it happened that uh, the two of us were both committed to our pews in the South Transept. Um, <laughs> The first time I saw him there, uh, seated in front of me, I was not completely certain that it was him. And so after the service, I leaned forward and not really thinking, I said, are you Robert Jensen? Uh, and I was immediately grateful that I didn't include the middle initial, which would have been unbearably awkward. And he looked back at me, he was amused, and he said, well, that's my name. <laughs> so, so it started. Um, now, by that time, um, Jens was already limited in his mobility. Um, I saw him standing only a handful of times, um, and never without assistance. Um, his speech was inhibited because of disease, um, and for the same reason he had a tremor that made it hard for him to write. Um, and so the two inscriptions that he wrote for me in books are in this shaky labored handwriting, um, and it's a snapshot of this human fragility behind the clarity and force of the words on the, on the printed page. And it might have been possible for me to see him only as a figure, or abstractly as a theologian uh, whose work that I really admired um, and spent, you know, years of my life on. Um, were he younger, able-bodied, um, but the gens that I got to know, um, the, the, the gens whose legacy that I consider myself a part of, um, he was old. He was older. He was dependent. And so for that reason, I think I had to see him as a person. He was husband to Blanche, father to Kari, grandfather to Solve. And it was a person who'd produced all this theological writing, who'd been a student, who'd made friends and rivals who'd spent time with, with Karl Barth. And once, in fact, I, I asked him if he still thought about Barth. Um, and he, he kind of looked at me and he paused. And really seriously, he said that he couldn't write down his own name without thinking about Barth. And then he looked at me and he was like, it must feel the same way for you. <laughs> and... And surely part of Bart's legacy is not just that Jens understood him well, um, but that something personal occurred between them, that Jens couldn't write down his own name without dealing with Bart. Um, and that is how I think of Jens' legacy. So like many of his students, like Adam, I, I first met him on the page, beginning in my case with the first volume of the Systematic Theology. I'd been reading... Marx and the novels of Michel Welbeck, which is to say, I was looking over into the edge of the abyss and I was wondering what truth was down there. And like most Christians in a liberal Protestant tradition, I did not know how to read the Old Testament as Christian scripture. So when I read the systematic theology, I knew that I'd found someone who knew my situation intimately. And in retrospect, it was a little presumptuous of me, but I brought that certainty into our conversations from the beginning. We did discuss a lot of theology. We, we certainly read books together. We read Augustine, we read James Cohn. We got to read several books of the Bible together, always from the Old Testament. But most of our conversations could not resist the pull of the news of the day, matters of politics, culture, the threat of nihilism. And what began for me as a suspicion when I read his work was confirmed after a few years of conversation. Matters of politics and culture were an animating source of his theology. Um, even in its most abstract and metaphysical, beginning with his, 
his earliest and most fundamental essays, like Proclamation Without Metaphysics, which was in 1962, or Eschatological Politics and Political Eschatology a few years later, each of these was was far from an intellectual exercise that did not need to justify its existence. He approached theology with this haunted awareness that the goods on which human life depends are not self-evident, that meaninglessness and violence are real possibilities. And so without reducing theology to autobiography or treating psychology as fate, I would say that Jens not only wrote what he believed was true, but he also wrote from this position of spiritual necessity Gospel must not be law. The apparent meaninglessness of time must be redeemed. The Lord must identify himself by and with created history. The bones must live. I suspect that it's because of his startling and contested metaphysical claims that the political dimension of his thinking has often been overlooked. But I suggest that Jens' theology cannot be well understood apart from political and cultural concerns, and that his approach to these concerns is really a vital feature of what his theology has to offer. And while what we do with our communities and our money and our bodies are perennial questions, these questions are more acute for Christians uh, in, in our time than they've ever been. His insights are more pressing now than when he wrote them. Um, so there remains these treasures to be won from his work, um, from his earlier engagements with revolutionary politics uh, to his later apparently more conservative discussions of things like the gender of God or human sexuality and abortion. I'm regularly surprised when I revisit his work that he's always more radical than I have the courage to remember. And that beneath the shifts in his political attention is the commitment to what makes life human. The fact that the God of scripture is holy and utterly personal. So that the basis of life is the fact that the Lord has addressed us and called us to respond in prayer. The address of God and our invitation to respond is at once the basis for our life in Christ and also our political life together. So Jens remains for me, uh, a constant conversation partner. Um, he was right. I don't get to write down my name without dealing with him. And I suspect that there are many for whom this is true, even if they didn't get to know him personally. Um, and of course, he would insist that the gospel's promise is precisely for this situation, that death has no finality. Um, our separation from him is only for a time. Um, and his, his true legacy is, of course, this faith. I've, uh, I've held on to a few uh, voicemails that he left me in the last months of his life. And uh, I'm going to conclude by sharing with you the last one, which is, um, here's what he said after he got home from a medical facility. This is Jens just reporting in that I'm home in one piece and I'd love to see you sometime soon. That's pretty much what I've got to say. <laughs> Kari Gold will now share from uh, some reflections from Kara Slade. We're so sorry that Kara couldn't be here today. She's doing the Lord's work uh, with Episcopal priests. So that's, uh, we wish her well. And I just want to say that our whole family is grateful to Kara uh, for her wonderful presence at Trinity. It is a profound privilege to send my greetings to you all from the meeting of the General Board of Examining Chaplains of the Episcopal Church, the governing body that writes and grades the ordination exam for aspiring Episcopal priests. I'm grateful to Kate and everyone at the BART Center for their kind invitation to say something about gents this evening on behalf of myself and of Trinity Church. I'm also grateful more than I can express to Blanche, Kari, Lucky, Solvay, and Joshua for their friendship, as well as their generosity in giving the Jensen papers to the BART Center. As I write this reflection, I am painfully aware that I am the only person speaking at this event. 
or rather speaking vicariously through Kari, who never knew gents in the way that most of the people in this room did. I came to Trinity Church and to Princeton three months after he died. So gents and I will have to wait for the consummation of all things to meet each other in that face-to-face -face sense. I met him through his words, first through Stanley Haueras, who introduced me and many other eager Duke seminarians to that famous sentence, the one that Stanley said took decades to be able to write. God is whoever raised Jesus from the dead, having before raised Israel from Egypt. I met him next during my dissertation research as an interpreter of Barth, of course, and that is why we are here today at the Barth Center. But finally, and most importantly, I met him as a husband, father, and grandfather, as a parishioner who is buried in the memorial garden that stands between this library and the entrance to Trinity Church. He is one of our great cloud of witnesses. It is exquisitely appropriate that Jens awaits the coming of the one who is Alpha and Omega in that fruitful space between Trinity Church and PTS, where the ecclesial and academic worlds meet each other. It's also appropriate that he is buried closer to the church. <laughs> because he was and is a theologian for the church. He has taught us all that theology should be theological. That is to say that it should be about God and not a form of psychology, sociology, or politics shouted in a loud voice. At the same time, he taught us that the theological word view permeates every aspect of how we live our lives, personal, familial, political, and cultural. And he, he has taught us all that theology cannot exist without the church. On all these points, Jens and Bart continue to speak to us together against some of the most troubling, if not particularly new, currents in the discipline. Last summer, I had the opportunity to give a lecture to a group of Episcopal clergy on the topic of formation for the church today. And I used a little essay Jens wrote called The Return to Baptism in Encounters with Luther. Drawing on the large catechism, he writes, baptism is the casting of the old into the waters and the appearance of the new. Not just in Luther, but in the whole tradition, baptism has never been understood as nearly the beginning of new life. Baptism is that ending of the old and beginning of the new, which is life. The old life ends when I submit myself to the waters, and the new self is an eschatological self, a self in the kingdom, a self in the spirit. And while there is an absolute once and for all aspect to the sacramental act, the Christian life after baptism does not exist on an upward trajectory where we never again have to return to these questions. Specifically, he says, how do we return to baptism? The answer is simple, but wrenching. Give up your past life again to the judgment of God, as you did when you first gave up yourself to the waters, where in the pattern of the sacraments we apprehend again the death of the old and the birth of the new. There is no room for a narrative of progress here, and no room for a theology of baptism that marks a beginning but not an end a welcome without true transformation. Here, the old Adam must die and die and die. What happened when I said these things out aloud in front of a group of Episcopal clergy was interesting to say the least. Most people thought it was exactly right. Why don't we hear more of this from the pulpit? I need to hear this, exclaimed, exclaimed the one lay person in the room. <laughs> But then there was the one priest who said he was shocked, in a bad way. 
to hear someone talk about sin and judgment so vehemently in an Episcopal context. I said, yes, yes, maybe we should talk about it more, and then it won't be so shocking. <laughs> he was not satisfied by this answer. But this is the gift that Jens gave to us and to me, the gift of truthful and courageous speech about the reality of God and the reality of the human condition, the gift of the true story in a world that has lost its story. There are many more things I could say about his massive contributions to systematic theology, or about his theological engagements with culture, or about his contributions to the study of Lutheranism. But as someone who is mostly a parish priest these days, I would like to give particular thanks for his commitment to Christian teaching in the church, what many people call Christian formation, but which he called Christian nurture. I will let other people talk about his other works, but I want to express my particular gratitude for his real magnum opus, Conversations with Poppy about God. I love that little book. I love it so much that I gave a copy to my godson, Robbie, last weekend at his baptism. I love it so much that I want Trinity Church to give a copy to every child baptized in our parish. I am not entirely kidding when I say it's his magnum opus. Because if a theologian cannot answer the questions of an eight-year-old in a way that she can understand, even an eight-year-old as precocious as Solve, then he doesn't actually understand what he's doing on the deepest level. But Jens understood. That act of translation shows the depths of his gifts. At one point in that book, Solvay and Poppy are talking about the Nicene Creed, and in particular about the line, through him all things were made. At that point, Solvay says, well, I would like to say that Jesus is not the one who wrote the many movies Daddy is writing. He did not write your systematic theology. Poppy responds, that's certainly true. But that's the same point we made earlier, isn't it? In one way, we do what we do, but we would not do it if it were not for God. That, I think, is a fair summary of the legacy of Robert W. Jensen. He would not have done it if it were not for God. Thank you all, and thank you, Jens. And thank you, Kara. You'll have to forgive me. I've had a bad back since the late 90s and haven't given a lecture standing up since then. But I take comfort in the fact that originally lectures in theology were all given from a stool, which is why the Germans call it a professorship, a Lehrstuhl. It's true. Uh, we are running about 25 minutes ahead of time, which gives me more time to tell stories. Um, yeah, what was said there at the very end about uh, if you can't communicate the truth of the gospel to an eight-year-old, you probably can't communicate it to anyone else either. It comes down in the final analysis to really understanding the gospel. If you've understood what you want to say before you attempt to say it, you're always going to be more clear. And the truth of the matter is nothing that was said in that conversation with Solve as an eight-year-old is any different than what's said in the systematic theology. It's just said with a lot more sophistication, but it's the same exact message. Everything was packed into what he said to you, which you'll hear a little bit about in a minute. Robert Jensen truly was, in our time, what he himself described Jonathan Edwards as being, America's theologian. Jens was this for many reasons, most of them academic. His breadth of learning, his gift of penetrating insight, his ability to express complex ideas in simple and memorable ways. Jens is notorious for economy. He says everything quickly, 
It's often densely written. Every word counts, and it's always meaningful. But there are other more personal reasons. Gents was mentor to almost everyone who crossed his path, to the great pleasure and benefit of those who received counsel from him. In my two year-long stays at the CTI, I had frequent reason to marvel at the fact that there was no resident member, regardless of which theological discipline they represented, to whose work Jens was not able to make a substantial contribution. He knew something, and more than something, about almost everything. Indeed, he possessed the kind of encyclopedic knowledge that we associate with all the great ones, from Origen to Hans Urs von Balthasar. And he was generous to a fault, <clears throat> giving of his time and energy to make every work done at the CTI better than it would otherwise have been. That mentoring also extended to his appearances at the American Academy of Religion, where he attended far more papers than most do. Most go to connect with friends in the first instance, drink a lot of beer. And frequently, he spoke with the authors of the papers he enjoyed most. And he was a great conversationalist. Gents was America's theologian because so many other American theologians of his time treated him as such in practice. Gents directed but a single graduate student, formally speaking, during his Oxford days. In doing so, he bequeathed to us another great theologian, Colin Gunton. But he also informally directed the research of any number of my own graduate students, and I suspect the graduate students of others. Matt Bruce tells the story of how he and two fellow students, Adam Idle being one, were invited into the home of Robert Jensen every week for five years to do theology with him. It began, in Matt's case, with a year-long seminar, which Jens agreed to offer on the history of metaphysics from Parmenides to David Bentley Hart. <laughs> Since these were my students, and they could not get PhD credit for the seminar with the powers that be at Princeton, seminar, at Princeton Seminary, unless I pretended to co-teach it, I went along every week to fulfill all righteousness, though to my everlasting regret only for the second semester. The thing I want to say here is that I was not only not a co-teacher, I was a student alongside my students. It could not have been otherwise. Gents taught as any true master would, as one who has largely forgotten that he is not the author of the works he is treating, so completely did he indwell the works of thinkers like Nietzsche and Heidegger. He was able as a result to teach them from the inside, thus making them live before our eyes. But of course, he could also step away from the material and tell us stories of himself, of his life. A student once asked him a question about Heidegger. I think it was you, Adam. Jens responded, that's a great question. I asked it once of Heidegger myself. <laughs> And, and here was his answer. When he had finished, the student followed up. What made it possible for you to ask it? What was the occasion? Jen said, well, I was seated directly across from Heidegger at a dinner in the Black Forest. <laughs> My lucky students got to continue on with Jens for four more years after that seminar. Think of that. I remember stepping outside on the porch after one of those seminar meetings and doing a sort of abbreviated Letterman top 10 list. I gave top three reasons for why it was good to live in Princeton. I said, for me, the, the number three would be you students. I mean, we get fantastic students here. Number two is the presence of the BART Center here. And number one is Robert Jensen lives here. And we just experienced it. People take different things from Jensen's theology. That is to be expected, given that his admirers included folks from all across the ecclesial spectrum. The Orthodox, the Catholics, the Protestants, 
all took strong interest. And that could happen because Gensis theology embraced elements from all three major traditions. In my case, understandably, it was the Protestant side of his thought that set me in motion. And since I have time, I want to tell a story about being set in motion by Gens. I mean, he determined in many ways the course of my life for good or for ill. Uh, he gave a um, talk at a uh, Princeton theology department colloquium that met in the sitting room of Ellen Cherry, I want to say around 1998. And in the Q&A afterwards, I forgot, I've long forgotten how he got onto this topic, but he was discussing the God, God is dead theologies of the 1960s. And he said, you know, I never had much use at the time for William Hamilton. He said, but Thomas J.J. Altizer said, him I understood. He said, Altizer did not want a disembodied God, and neither do I. And he then proceeded to critique uh, a, a theological point that is essential to reform thinking, and that is the extra Calvinisticum. And he said the problem with the extra Calvinisticum amongst the reform is it gives us a disembodied God. And so I went to him after and I said, you know, Bart's a reform theologian, and it's just not true that his God is disembodied. And I think his teaching on the extra, Calvinist, extra Calvinisticum um, actually uh, belongs in the same space that you and Altizer are occupying. And he said, that's a wonderful insight. You should write a paper on that, which I did for the Cambridge Companion to Karl Barth. And look at all the trouble it got me into. <laughs> Years later, Gents was uh, in hospice care at home, and I was teaching that fall a seminar on the theologies of Robert Jensen and Eberhard Jungel in my PhD seminar. And I sent a bibliography along to Blanche, and Blanche graciously invited me over to uh, let me discuss it with uh, Gents. And when I walked in, I was very worried because Gents looked... Um, like he might be unable to talk that day. He was so uh, overwhelmed by the illness. But once he saw me, he immediately sat up and he, and he lifted his finger and the very first words out of his mouth was, and it had to do with my bibliography, the first words out of his mouth was, Altizer is our ally. <laughs> if you haven't really thought that one through, you probably need to, um, especially if you consider yourself a devoted a uh, student of Gensis theology, because it, it tells you an incredible amount uh, about that theology that I think is of great importance. Okay. In what remains my time, I want to say just a few words about what made Gents, in my opinion, to be an evangelical Catholic, with the emphasis on evangelical or Protestant in this, in this case. To do so is to acknowledge publicly why he meant the world to me as a Protestant theologian. So what is distinctively Protestant in Gensis theology? Where is the Protestant element to be discerned? I'm not interested here today in doctrinal questions. The word Protestant is not meant today to ask about his take, for example, on the doctrine of justification. What I have in mind is something far more fundamental. Robert Jensen was a profoundly original thinker. Throughout his work, Jens displayed what Karl Barth once called freedom under the word, a word which Barth identified with Jesus Christ and saw in and through his narrated history in the Bible. That identification and the priority given to biblical attestation meant that other words could only be human words, however important they might be, however much guidance they might offer us. The distance separating the word from dogma, Bart tells us, is as great as the distance from heaven and earth. Freedom under the word meant specifically in this context, freedom with regard, with, from regard for dogmas as law. Robert Jensen displayed this freedom with striking ease and without calling attention to it. He can be quite critical of Chalcedon, for example, in volume one of his systematic theology. Even more significantly, he departed from the God concept that lay in back of the Nicene formulations in fundamental ways. 
It was that freedom, I think, which made Gents to be so original. To do theology as an act of daring, of courage. Gents was a true thinker who thought the thought of God at the deepest possible level. Two quick examples of his departures from the God concept presupposed at Nicaea and Constantinople I. The first comes from his contribution to the Providence College Conference on Divine Impassibility held in 2008. The essay that, re that uh, was published from this conference offers a striking move beyond the otherwise insupera insuperable division created by fixed definitions of impassibility on the one side and passability on the other. The first definitions of impassibility, excuse me, the first impassibility requires a definition of eternity as timelessness to get off the ground. The second, passability, requires a collapse of God's time into our time. Gent says that neither does justice to the history of God with God's people as attested in the Bible. And so neither passability nor impassibility can be understood to be statically possessed characteristics of God. Quoting Gents, when both answers to a question poised between contradictories seem wrong or both right, the question may be wrongly posed. Perhaps in divinus, in matters of God, ex est passibilis is not the right contradictory to ex est impassibilis. Perhaps ex non est impassibilis is in divinis the precisely right stipulation. Of course, this negation of impassibility does tilt things in a particular direction. We already heard that in Solveig's discussion over, over uh, God as personal, as responding to our prayers, as not fixed in God's self. But we miss Jens's genius if we see only that. We need to understand the reason for the tilt to appreciate the profundity of the insight which animates him. Jens proposes that there is indeed something like what we call narrative time in God. Or to be more exact, quote, there is in the imminent life of God that of which narrative time, as we know and experience it, is something like. Clearly, Jens is thinking analogically here, and analogically be it noted from God's time to ours. Our narrative time is something like God's time. God, he suggests, quote, transcends any conceivable linear time, as the partisans of divine impassibility rightly insist. And by the same token, he transcends any conceivable mere negation of our times, the negation on which the partisans of divine impassibility also seem to insist. If eternal is taken with the Greeks to mean simply not temporal, it cannot be used of the real God. Unquote. But now look what happens once you say with gents that our narrative time is something like the time that is God's and that God transcends any mere negation of our times. Room is left for a certain kind of before and after in God even if saying as much implies a certain subordination of the begotten to the begetter. Clearly, this is what Jens thinks. He thinks that it, is not, that it is only the inner Trinitarian relations which allow us to say anything true about God's time, but that those relations have often been hindered from making a contribution by the sheer fact that eternity has been defined through the mere negation of our time. Where eternity is so defined, there is no room left for speaking of the eternal generation of the Son by the Father as manifesting any, even logical, before the Father and an after the Son, not even one that is only analogically related to our before and after. Instead, eternal generation is absorbed into an alleged simultaneity of Father and Son, such that eternal generation could only logically be allowed where each is the source of the other, and indeed where each person of the Trinity is the source of the other two, 
as simultaneity requires. If then we ask with gents, what must eternity be if it is true that the son is, quote, born in time of a woman, unquote, then we must allow that there is a certain before and after in God, after all, which must be honored. Quoting gents, thus the assertion that all points on any timeline are simultaneous for him, for God, and the assertion that they are not simultaneous for God are equally meaningless. That's just brilliant. What Jens has accomplished with these moves is to clear the ground for the acknowledgement that God is at least also passable, noting with origin that pity, quote, is a dispositional affect necessarily present in anyone who loves. Jens adds, quote, this affect must be in God and indeed as eternally antecedent in the Father, as the ground in God for involvement in Conversazione humane dite, an involvement centering in the son's passion. Therefore, not only the son, but the son's father is not impassable, unquote. The tilt here to passability in relation to the concrete events and persons of our history is clear. The only point remaining to be made is that Jens continues to use the word impassibility to suggest that nothing that happens in our history can affect God's commitment to God's people, leading to the suggestion that while God is impassable in relation to our total history, God is passable in relation to particular events. In the brief compass of 10 published pages, Gents managed to direct a discussion that had reached an impasse after decades of fruitless back and forth onto a new path. He could do that because he experienced too true freedom under the word. His mind was free to roam, to explore new possibilities rather than defend already acquired standpoints. I would submit that this is why he will always be read so long as theology continues to be done. Another example, this time from an even briefer essay. Once more, the Logos Asarkos, this time only five pages in length. Jens regarded the creation of a Logos Christology in the early centuries as, quote, an historical mistake, if perhaps an inevitable one. I can't get away with saying things like that. I'm glad that he could. <laughs> The coordinated realities borne witness to in the New Testament, he says, were Jesus and his father, not the son Logos and his father. And so, quote, we must not posit the son's antecedent subsistence in such fashion as to make the incarnation the addition of the human Jesus to a son who was himself without him. Relationship is there in the beginning, and it's a relationship to Jesus He is able to claim some support for that conclusion insofar as Mary is regarded as the Theotokos. But clearly he has felt free to challenge and correct the tradition in this essay. For gents, Jesus is made to be the Son of God by his resurrection through the Spirit, Romans 1.4. Not by, quote, divine origin as the Christological tradition might make us expect, unquote. The son's subsistence is therefore, quote, as much from the spirit as telos, as from the father as arche, unquote. Thinking along these lines, Gents is able then to specify in what the pre-existence of the son actually finally consists. It consists not in the pre-existence of Jesus as a specimen of humanity, but of Jesus' relation to the Father. There again is that word relationship. And so, quote, it is Jesus' relation to the Father, which is the second hypostasis of Trinity. Now, clearly, this is original thinking, which could only take place because gents felt free to engage in it. Not constrained by the past, but as open to the future, the future of God might well be the motto 
for the whole of Robert Jensen's theological work throughout his life. Again, I rejoice that now the Robert Jensen papers will be available to scholars and to the larger public, to anyone invested in, interested in knowing about or understanding better America's theologian. I would like once more to thank Blanche Jensen, Kari and Lucky Gold and Solveig Gold and Joshua Katz for the trust they have shown in the center in allowing us to provide an institutional home for the Jensen papers. By the way, if you wish to have access to these papers, you should write directly to Caitlin Dugan, our director, who will help you with that. And I want to thank the members of our audience, both here in this room and online, for honoring the legacy of Robert Jensen with their presence. And finally, I want to thank Yanan Mello for coordinating the virtual component of our conference today. And Christina Astorito, Assistant Director of Conferences and Events Services for coordinating many of the logistics. This concludes our conference. I invite those present here to the Theron, in the Theron Room to join us in the atrium for wine and cheese in 28 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>